Hello guys, welcome to M&D Made Simple. I'm your host, Coach Alexander. We're going to be considering the monitoring and evaluation report writing. I know this is something we all do, but I feel that we need to understand the whole purpose of why we write reports and some tips that you should employ when you are doing this reporting to your bosses or to other stakeholders. So it's going to be a good presentation. I hope you guys will watch it from start to finish. It's, from, it's for everybody, whether you've been in the field for a short time or a long time. But I wanted to talk about something we, we, we prepared for everybody around the world. You can access M&D short courses on the website. The website is just here, monitoringandevaluation.com. It's quite a relatively new website. So there, there are short free courses, which you can go through at your own pace, at your own time. So please do well to, to get this information for free. There's obviously some things that are paid for where you have to pay, but I mean, at the end of the day, you do what suits you best. So please take time to look at that, uh, those provisions at the website. Okay, let's, so let's get started. This is a very simple presentation. What is a report? So a report, people, is, um, is simply information. I like to think of it as information that you give to people so that they can be able to make an informed decision. So the dictionary which I use, it's, it's just there so that you, you get some simple explanation. But I'm telling you guys, from my experience, having worked for many years in the M&D field, a report is simply information that you give to stakeholders so that they know about the progress that your project is making, or they know what challenges they are facing, or they know exactly whether there is need to redesign the project. It's a lot of things, really. But essentially, they want to, you're giving information so that people get to understand how well your project is doing. So the report, why is this so important? It is important because of the stakeholders. But not just the stakeholders. Let's say you write a proposal you win funding from some donor out there. They give you the money and you implement activities. So the first thing which you are concerned about, let, let's assume you are seated in management. The first thing you are concerned about is whether you are achieving your targets. The reason you have this strong concern is because your donors are constantly questioning whether you are doing the right thing. And the only way they're going to know whether things are going the right way is when you generate a report. So the report will help in making decisions, especially if you notice that you are not really achieving your targets, what should be done in order to become, uh, to get back in line, to get back on schedule, what should really be done? So that's what a report essentially does. It helps solve the problems. So in M&D, there are different types of reports. You've got the quarterly report, which is done every three months. You've got the annual report, which is done once a year. You've got the monitoring report, which is done regularly throughout the year. Okay, maybe let me highlight the difference between, uh, there's not really a difference, it's probably the same thing, but I just want to highlight something. Monitoring is done every day. It can be done also weekly, uh, monthly, and so on, okay? It's done throughout the project cycle. So when you generate a monitoring report, it really depends what period you are, you are trying to generate this report on. So if you were doing these activities for a month, let's say, the report that you generate will be a monthly monitoring report. If you do it after three months, then it becomes quarterly. It becomes a quarterly monitoring report, okay? 
But now the reason why I just brought this out is because I want you just to understand that the different types of reports and monitor a monitoring report is one of them. Then we've got the famous evaluation report. That's the report where you, you see uh, consultants hand you a very big, big document with maybe 200 pages. That's the same report that I'm talking about. So the evaluation reports, remember, there are three types of evaluations that can be conducted. In most cases, I'm not saying always, but in most cases, you've got the baseline, you've got the midterm evaluation, and then you've got the end line evaluation. So the baseline is an evaluation in case of in case people didn't know that you're hearing it for the first time, please take it from me. Uh, it's a, what is known as an exant. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. E X A N T E, exant evaluation, which is a baseline, and it's also known as for a formative uh, study. Then you've got the midterm evaluation. Then you've got the end line evaluation. So those are the evaluation reports. Then you've got the audit report. So the audit report is also a, a, a tool used in m and in case you guys didn't know it. So this uh, audit report, uh, as, an, as the term audit uh, tells you, that if you search on the internet, look for the definition. The audit is uh, an activity conducted in order to see or check whether there is compliance to the standards that you've set. So you've obviously heard of the data quality audit. So the data quality audit is done in order to check whether the quality, the levels of data quality in an institution are good enough. Okay, so those are the, the different types of reports. Please write to me if you've, uh, if you've come across other types of reports, but these are the ones which are usually used in uh, M&D. Okay, now let's look at the basic principles of writing an effective M and D report. And I want to make I want to make this very clear to everyone. When I say M and D report, please always remember that there's no such thing as an M and E report. All right, and the reason being is. Uh, the M and E, the word M and E has two activities. You've got the monitoring, you've got the evaluation. So these two can't exist simultaneously. Okay, so we just use M and E report because we're talking about two reports and you, you usually just have to apply the same principles, basic principles of report writing, but please get it get it clear that we are just uh, there are two uh, reports in one okay uh, so now let's let's go go the step by step so let's look at the principles so the first one is when you are writing a report you need to establish what the purpose is before you write any report make sure you establish what the purpose of this report is. What do I mean? Well, like I mentioned at the onset of this slide, let's talk about a monitoring report. If you're writing a monitoring report, you know the purpose is to report on activities that were implemented and whether the target was achieved. So that's what the monitoring report aims to achieve. But if you look at an evaluation report, it reports on um, the overall results achieved. Did the program achieve the results it intended to achieve? So that is where now you talk about issues to do with how effective was the pro program? How efficient was it? Is it sustainable? Did it register the impact we wanted to see? Was it relevant? Those are the issues. 
So the reason why you sit down to decide on these aspects is because it will give you an idea of also what indicators to report on. Remember that in most cases, when you're writing a, a monitoring report, the indicators you are reporting on are the lower level ones, the outputs, the activities. But when it comes to the evaluation report, emphasis is on the higher level results. Now, another principle is whenever you are doing any report, it must be based on facts. I know this sounds very simple, but when you are reading, when, only when you read some of the reports that are out there, you get to understand that, you, you get to understand that sometimes we tend to just write stuff, but without backing it with data. Even the decisions that management make, have you noticed that sometimes their decisions are not even based on any data, they are just making decisions, and then you sit down and question, where is this decision coming from? The report did not bring this out. And this is uh, my appeal. If you are watching this as a manager, if you are watching this as a director, or even a CEO, please understand the purpose of these reports. When a report is generated to your office, you should be able to act on it and not just let it gather dust in your office. So essentially, decision-making requires first that you get the facts correctly. Don't rely on rumors. Don't rely on people just giving their own opinion. Of course, you may have reliable sources, but make sure that those sources are legit. Another issue that I want to talk about is how you organize the report. I'm one person who believes that the monitoring report doesn't need to be too detailed. Because if you have a lengthy monitoring report, and then you have all these activities with strict deadlines, you may waste a lot of time just reading a long monitoring report. So I would advise that M&D officers uh, have a short report, but yet it is rich in findings, in numbers, and also recommendations. So the, the way the report is organized is the standard reporting structure, which we'll talk about. There's a slide for that. But I think the point with this principle is that make sure you know exactly how you structure that, that report and make sure it's logical. Don't just put things for the sake of putting them in there, but let it count, let them have meaning. Another principle is that you need to be objective in your writing. Very important. Demonstrate impartiality. Imagine you go for an event somewhere. Your, your boss tells you, go to this event. And when you come back from that event, tell me what happened. Don't write things. Don't write your opinions. You will not write about your opinions, basically. You won't start saying, I think I don't like the way that person dressed at that meeting. That is irrelevant. The issue is what happened. That is what people want to know. What took place in the field? Can you back it up with evidence? Those are the issues people want to know. So don't use your opinions. That is not, your opinion matters, yes? But it's not really, it's not the, the reason why you are writing this report. State what happened. State whether um, 
the activities were conducted. You go in the field, you find that the activity wasn't conducted. You simply state it in your report. You can state why the activity wasn't conducted, but don't say, I think it wasn't conducted because this field officer is lazy. That doesn't help anybody. So let's uh, polish up in that area. Another issue which we need to guide, guide ourselves is how we use uh, our English language. Or it could be other language that you are using in your own jurisdiction to write the report, basically. Avoid using academic complicated language. Avoid that. Because know your audience. It may not be easy for everybody to understand what you're saying. What purpose is a report if you are the only one who knows what is it saying, but other people don't know? So make it clear. I like the way some NGOs, even the United Nations, if you've noticed the way the United Nations uh, does its reporting. I've not read a lot of their reports, but I'll talk about a one report, which is called the Sustainable Development Goals Report. I'll, I'll do a video one of these days to talk about that, the findings from that report, because unfortunately, uh, they're not very promising findings, but they also give reasons why it's like that. So the, the language there is clear and concise. They use images to make the reader enjoy what they are reading. You know, it, it adds to the experience. Another principle you need to adhere to is how you summarize your findings. So your findings should be well summarized. I talked about uh, how, the, how important it is to sometimes use images in your report. It adds to the experience for readers. But another issue is when you are summarizing your findings, make sure that these findings are tied to the indicators. Don't put in things that people don't want. That is not why they are funding that project. There are things that they want to, to see, and those things are the indicators. How did these indicators perform? So make sure you do that. Another important aspect, and this, anyway, it goes both ways, both for the M&D officer and for those people who, who apply to be consultants to do evaluations. I'm targeting you because sometimes you have this problem. The conclusion should be tied to the objective of the whole, um, the whole activity. Basically, your objective is to establish whether progress was made for in, in the project. So in your conclusion, you should simply state, was the pro did the project achieve its intended goals or not. Don't start going in circles all over the place because it will be difficult for people to understand. The opening paragraph of the conclusion should be concise. Simply just state, did it achieve its goals, yes or no? You state, yes, the project achieved its goals However, some goals were not achieved and these were the following. List those goals. Then mention, you could mention even the challenges and then in your recommendations, you, you write how to resolve those challenges. You recommend what should be done to resolve those challenges. Because the minute now you, you have a conclusion that's going to now be just more like a copy and paste of what is 
in the main document, people will now have five to 10 minutes to read just a conclusion. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, so have the recommendations clearly stated. Then lastly, but not the least, is to proofread your document. Have you noticed, let me go back to the United Nations because the, for obvious reasons, the UN has the, the best, I believe they have the best staff, staff globally. They attract the best. So if you look at their report, for example, I have never seen a report. I'm no, I know there could be those reports, but I've not seen a report that is, uh, has errors grammatical errors. I have not seen that with the UN. Everything is, uh, maybe if there's nothing that's perfect, but if I were to grade them, 97%, 98% in terms of the way they write their reports. And that's what, uh, that's my encouragement to you people. Uh, you can download, especially their report, which is the Sustainable Development Goals report for this year. It, it's somewhere on the internet. And the good thing, they give this for free. Download that report. So now, what am I trying to say here is that you should proofread. If you have the money, hire someone to proofread for you. Because it's one thing to write a report, but sometimes it may be challenging to actually have the time to look for these errors because your, your mind is already overwhelmed. So you can get someone who can write on your behalf. I mean, proofread on your behalf. Okay, so guys, as I earlier mentioned, free courses up for grabs. Have, if you have the time, please go to, to the monitoringandevaluation.com website. Now, how often should you report? If it was possible, I would say daily. Report on activities on a daily basis, if you have the time, that is. But basically, the reporting frequency is based on resource availability. That's really the basic principle here. It's dependent on resource availability. So if you have the time, let's talk about time. If you have the time to go all over, all over your project sites to gather data, then you can gauge yourself and say, okay, we have all the time. Let's be doing this monthly. We have the money. We have the manpower. Let's do this on a monthly basis. But in most cases, it is not like that. Because just to compile a report, can be quite involving. So depending on what you think, you can do it quarterly. The, the standard reporting that I've seen, quarterly, semi-annually, and even annually. Another aspect you need to uh, remember is that your reporting frequency depends on the, the type of indicators that you have. So I know some of you who are here for the first time you are just completely amazed. Where is this guy getting all this information? I want to mention that I've been doing this for 10 year, over 10 years now. So I know what I'm saying in this regard. Your indicator needs to be brought into consideration because the issue is this. If your high level indicator, if for example, let's say the impact indicators, the highest level indicators, for you to see change, it takes maybe three years, two to three years for you to, to see change. The question I have for you is then why would you go in the field to collect data annually when you know you won't even see any meaningful change on this particular indicator? Because it takes three years to see it, you get the point. So the point here is that if you are going to uh, get data on a, a particular indicator, you need to know uh, 
how or how soon the change will be. Will the change happen at the, the, the time and rate that you want? No. So that's the issue you have to remember. But for output or activity indicators, such as number of trainings conducted, that's a common indicator. I can assure you, if you go on the internet right now, you're going to see a lot of these projects like that, that indicator called number of trainings. So that indicator takes, uh, it's, it, 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 I mean, you can do it monthly because it is an indicator that's at the lower level of the results framework. Then another issue that affects reporting frequency is what the management has decided. So if the management, let's say you, you wake up one morning and you get a call from your manager and then he says, why aren't you in the field? Why aren't you doing your monitoring? Then you as the M&D officer tell the manager and say, no, you know, um, I cannot do the monitoring because I'm looking at the indicators and all of these are high level indicators. So I, I would rather uh, we do it after a certain period of time. But then the manager insists, what are you doing there? Just go in the field. You get the point. This has happened before. So the issue is that you can't fight with your supervisors. All you can do sometimes is just educate them. If they insist that a certain thing should be done, simply go. And that goes even with when you're writing your reports. There's, they may ask you to report on an indicator that's not even in your log frame. Why have they done that? It could be because the donors want to see that information. So just follow what they say, because ultimately it's not you who has to, to answer to questions at the end of the day, but it is the management. You are a tool to report. You are their eyes and ears on the ground. Okay. How do we write a report? That is the standard format. The standard format for writing a report in most cases is what you see in front of you. You've got the cover page. You've got the table of contents. You've got the executive summary, introduction, all the way down to recommendations. This kind of format, let me talk about, first of all, the monitoring report. The monitoring report, guys, doesn't have to adopt this format. Because if you remember what I said earlier on, the, the, the monitoring report, in my view, should not be too lengthy because you don't just have the time. Decisions have to be made. Activities are being implemented. So the, if you spend too much time coming up with a monitoring report, man, management won't make the decisions on time. So the monitoring report should be ready maybe five days after you've come from the field or even three days so that you can quickly submit to management. So some of these things may not be necessary. So what are these things, for instance? Well, the, I think the cover page should be there, but I'm not sure about the table of contents. Because table of contents, of course, yes, you want people to navigate, but it's a short report, so they won't need that to navigate. Because it's a short report, they can easily trace the section that they want. Executive summary is fine, but it's, you know, so for me, I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to, because, you know, even summarizing findings can be challenging. So I scrapped that out. Introduction, objectives, methodology, findings should be there in the monitoring report. Uh, the discussion, I feel, should go. Conclusion and recommendation, very important. So the monitoring report should have those sections. I hope you were taking notes. But now let's go to the evaluation report. The evaluation report should have all of those things. Because why? It is 
a big report. We've seen this happen before, and it will continue to happen. It's a big report, and that's how the standard should be. But another thing I should also mention is, uh, as an organization, uh, I've seen organizations actually atop, adopt their own uh, their own standard of reporting. So they will probably just ask you to fill in a table and that's what constitutes a report. It's fine. I mean, it's your, it's your standard. But ultimately, the issue is at the end of the day, management should know what to do if there's a problem existing. So that when they take corrective action, the project improves. That's the whole essence of what we are doing here. It's for continuous, uh, it's for corrective action and continuous improvement. Let's talk about reporting findings. Before I go to this uh, slide, there's one common problem that I've seen, and please, uh, I'm, I'm kindly asking that we don't take offense if you are doing it because I'm only here to help you. So there's one issue that I've noticed when it comes to reporting findings. We tend to like reporting numbers. We conducted 100 trainings this quarter. That is not a bad thing. But the next question I'll ask is what do these numbers mean? You get the point. Because if I, if I tell people that we conducted 100 trainings, the next question some people will ask is, okay, so what? What does that mean? So essentially you need to, when you're doing the report, it needs to be meaningful to the reader. They need to understand what this whole, uh, these numbers translates to. So the best way, before I go to the do's and don'ts, the best way to cure that problem is to ensure that uh, your reports, when you have numbers like that, make a comparison to the targets. That's when it, that's when it becomes more meaningful. So if you say I conducted 100 trainings and then you further go on to say that these trainings were an, an improvement from the previous reporting period. However, we failed to meet the target of conducting 120 trainings. That will make a lot of sense. Or you can say we fulfilled the target of conducting 90 trainings, we surpassed the target. That's when it becomes more meaningful. Okay, so what are the do's and don'ts? Number one, I mentioned this before, report on the key performance indicators of the project. Don't add things that are not required. It just makes the analysis even more confusing. Report on things that are approved as indicators. Now, like I mentioned earlier on, sorry, I'm talking a lot. Some people have written to me that coach, you talk too much, but I'm sorry because I'm trying to cure some issues here. The management are going to tell you to add certain things. Now I've, I've highlighted to you guys that that's not necessarily a bad thing because their stakeholders are demanding that. So you can add, but they make sure that even when you add whatever you're adding, there should be a record because probably the following year, you'll still be asked to collect the same. So you have to be able to, to have that record of what you collected previously and be able to make those comparisons. Always make a comparison to the target, always. If your organization doesn't have targets, 
have a meeting, request for a meeting where you can develop targets as a team. Having targets makes the whole thing meaningful for you. And it also makes your job easier. Because if you are just reporting numbers, what do these numbers mean? But when you compare them to targets, it's, it's easy to understand what we are trying to do here. Another issue is, uh, okay, maybe let, I'm sorry I'm doing it this way, but uh, let, me, let me try to correct the way I'm presenting this. The do's. We've talked about report on key indicators, all, and then the next one, always make comparison to the target. The other do's, mention the challenges faced and provide recommendations to those challenges. There's one common uh, recommendation that I've all, I've, I keep seeing whenever I'm reading reports. It is recommended that you should continue funding this project. And that's a common recommendation. I'm, I'm sure some of you have come across that same one. It's a good recommendation. But the question I have is, where is it coming from? You get the point. Whenever you have a recommendation in, in, in place, tie it to what is in the report. Okay, so that is uh, something. So let's not just automate recommendations. Let's tie it to what is in the report. The don'ts. Avoid attribution of project failure to a specific person, individual department, unless absolutely necessary. Avoid rationalizing the wrongs. What, what has happened is because there is a, a very high pressure. I've also been in this situation, mind you, and I'm speaking from experience. Because there's high pressure from the, the supporting stakeholders, donors, to see good results. There is a high, there's a temptation for M and D staff to always want to report good things. That pressure is very strong. So even when they see the, even when they see there's a wrong somewhere, they'll try to rationalize it. Let's say trainings were not conducted, but money was provided. And then you rationalize it. You say, although the trainings were not conducted, still there was a positive result because of the previous training which was conducted and blah, 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 things like that. Now that becomes a bit dangerous because if we rationalize things, it's like we are, we are masking the wrongs. The report, the M&D is meant to be transparent. Everybody should know what is really taking place and why did this thing happen? So as an officer, try as much as possible not to, not to sugarcoat things because ultimately, you know, it will come back to you. You may think you're doing something good, but it will eventually come back to you. People will ask, you reported this, but now again, you're doing this. There's no consistency. Another thing, another do, keep your report brief and to the point if it's a monitoring report. So I've talked about the monitoring report. So the monitoring report is designed to help you, to help management make decisions in good time. So that's why it's good to have it brief and to the point so that they have, they, they're able to read it quickly and act on it. But the dots avoid lengthy storytelling, which is not backed by facts. So 
if you are a, a good writer, if you've written a novel before, it might be you might be tempted to to tell stories, but that shouldn't be the point. Let's try to to adhere to what the stakeholders want. Another do introduce charts and graphs. That's a, an important thing. Like I said, it adds to the experience the reading experience when you see images in your report. Then avoid being boring. Yeah, so basically the boredom comes when one, the report is so lengthy, and also you haven't put some graphs or some colors, you've not added colors. My advice would be you can go on the internet, look at what other people have done. You'd be very encouraged because a lot of people now are incorporating what are known as uh, infographics in their reports to make it come out very, uh, very nice. And then last but not the least, please proofread your report and avoid errors and mistakes. Okay, now I want to talk about a tool that has been used by these big organizations, such as the USAID. And this is the use of indi indicator tracking tables. So indicator tracking tables are simply what you see in front of you. I've added the source of where I got this tracking table. I didn't really have time to come up with my own. I would have done so, but uh, I think this is okay. I know it's okay because I've, I've, I've referenced it. So if you look at the indicator tracking table, what do you see, guys? You can see that um, it's actually a good tool to in, include in your report, especially the monitoring report. Maybe not too much of the evaluation report. This thing, when you put it in the, the monitoring report, it's easy for management just to see in a, in a summary form what is taking place regarding all the indicators. So let's look at that activity, which is called the Centralized Irrigation System Rehabilitation Activity 1. So they've got the indicator. I'll, I'll talk about the output in the indicator. Okay, don't look at the outcome, look at the output, which says Centralized Irrigation Systems Rehabilitated. So basically what they are saying here is the project, I don't know, I don't know about this project. I didn't have time to read it, but I can already see what it's all about. So they are saying that how many irrigation systems have been um, rehabilitated? So at the start of the project, the baseline is zero. But then the Okay, here they don't have a yearly target of how many they want to rehabilitate, but which is good if they had it. Obviously, there are reasons why they didn't. So they, let's say the yearly target was to rehabilitate 20 irrigation systems. So meaning that that yearly target, you see, it would be at the, it will indicate 20 for that indicator. Then when you do the quarterly monitoring, you'll be you'll be checking how many were irrigated. Now, my, you know, it's not easy to do this project sometimes because when you do the monitoring, you, you may expect that, okay, I want to find the numbers of rehabilitations done. But when you go in the field, you just find that the rehabilitation is, uh, is, has started, but has not been completed. You go quarter one, 20 rehabilitations have started, but they've not been completed. You go to quarter two, it's still work in progress. Maybe in quarter three, then you'll find only three have been uh, rehabilitated. So what I'm saying here is that when you're reporting, even if it has started, for as long as it hasn't com been completed, you don't register it as a results achieved. So this indicator uh, tracking table, you put it, you can actually put it somewhere in the monitoring report. I usually like to place it 
uh, after the or, or before the introduction. It's more like an executive summary of what is taking place for the pro in the project. Okay, so guys, thank you so much for this time we spent together. So in case you have any questions, please write to me. I'll be happy to get back to you. If I don't write, write to you, please uh, just keep on uh, sending emails. Sometimes I miss these emails because of the, the overwhelming response I receive from different people. I've been your host, Coach Alexander, and see you on the other side. Bye.